Hi everyone, welcome to my channel, Dan Marsh Films. I'm Dan, and today we've got an exciting tutorial for you. Recently, I've been working on a few nighttime hyperlapse videos for some upcoming projects, and I've had several people asking to produce a tutorial video which covers the process from start to finish, including prep, execution, and post-production. Night hyperlapses can be incredibly cinematic and visually striking, but they come with their own set of challenges. I'm going to guide you through the entire process, including the technical aspects of shooting hyperlapses through to the planning, execution, and post-processing. Just before we jump into the action, make sure you hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It really helps me out and will help me to produce more videos like this in the future. Now let's get started. Just before we do get started, I just want to let you guys know that I have put markers in the video. So if you want to jump to a certain section, please do. Although I do recommend watching the entire video as this is a process and you might learn something on the way that you didn't know before. First things first, what exactly is a hyperlapse? Well, a hyperlapse is a time-lapse technique that involves moving the camera on the drone between each exposure to create a sense of motion. When it comes to shooting hyperlapses at night, there are unique challenges and considerations. The key is finding the right balance between capturing the beauty of your subject at night and avoiding over or under exposure, camera shake or jarring movements that can simply ruin your hard work. It is also important to create the right amount of motion blur in each image of your hyperlapse. I'll be using the DJI Mavic 3 Cine Pro for my hyperlapse, but these principles apply to all of the DJI drones with the hyperlapse feature. This includes the DJI Mavic Air, Mini Series, and some older iterations of the DJI drones. So firstly on this main screen you can see the shutter button and just above that shutter button is this little button here and what that shows us is what shooting mode we're in. So if you click that what you're going to see is all the different photo modes and video modes. Click hyperlapse which is the stopwatch looking icon and then under that you have four different options which is free, circle, course lock and waypoints. And I'm going to go through each of these in more detail further along in the video. Firstly, let's discuss an overview of the settings and technical details so we have a better understanding of what is required to produce a good hyperlapse before we get out shooting. For your camera settings, we have the options to change ISO, shutter speed, and depending on what drone you're using, the aperture. Some DJI drones don't have the option to change aperture, such as the Mavic Air or Mini. However, don't worry, as it's not imperative for hyperlapses. We'll start with the ISO. As we're shooting at night, you'll want to set your camera to the native ISO. ISO is the sensitivity amplification of the sensor. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive the sensor becomes, which makes the image brighter. However, in turn, this adds noise to the image. You may have seen noise before, those horrible static looking speckly dots we see flashing, which quite frankly look odd and distracting. Basically, it's not desirable to push the ISO and if we can avoid it, it will have a much clearer professional looking image. We can do this by setting it to the native ISO. Native ISO refers to the base or default sensitivity setting of a specific digital image sensor in a camera. It is the ISO setting at which the sensor operates most optimally to capture light without introducing additional electronic amplification. On all the DJI consumer drones, the ISO should be set to 100 as this is the native ISO. If need be, we can increase this once we have our other settings dialed in. Next is the shutter speed, also known as exposure time, which refers to the amount of time that a camera's shutter is open, allowing light to reach the camera's sensor. The shutter is the noise you hear on a conventional camera when you take a photo, and when you change the setting it will either sound faster or slower. Shutter speed is measured in seconds or fractions of a second, indicating the duration the shutter remains open during the process of taking a photograph. Fast shutter speed, for example, 1 1,000th of a second, allows for a brief exposure time capturing fast moving subjects with minimal motion blur. On the other hand, a slow shutter speed, say 1 second, results in a longer exposure which can convey motion and create intentional blur in certain scenes. As we are shooting at night, we want to let as much light in as possible without boosting the ISO. This also adds those beautiful dynamic light trails that we see in night time lapses. If we don't add this, we get a horrible jarring effect, not the smooth flow of motion through the scene, which is what we want. I have found the best time for drone hyperlapses is between 0.5 to 1 second. Normally, when you shoot with long exposure, you would do so on a tripod as you need the camera to be still to avoid a blurry image. 
In this case, our drone is going to be taking the photo and often will be blowing around in the wind. So we need to be wary of that when using a long shutter speed. And therefore, I would not go any longer than a second. And in more windy conditions, I would opt for about half a second. Finally, we have aperture. Not all drones have this, so don't worry about it if you can't change it. The fixed aperture on DJI drones is f2.8. This is basically wide open for all of the DJI drones, and this is what we want to allow as much light into the camera as possible. The lower the number, the more open it is, so f2.8 is the best setting for this. If you can change the aperture, sometimes it could be beneficial to shoot at f4, as I found this is the sharpest aperture on the Mavic Pro series of drones. However, you will likely need to sacrifice this for the addition of ISO. Now with our aperture set at f2.8, our shutter speed set between 0.5 and 1 second, we can assess the image and if it is still too dark, then we can add ISO as a last option. Everything I've just mentioned will produce a single long exposure photograph, but we want to effectively create a video, which is just photos played at a certain frame rate. This is dependent on what you are looking to achieve. Here in the UK, the standard frame rate is 25 frames per second, the US is 30 frames per second, and in cinema, it's usually 24 frames per second. For this example, I'll be creating a 25 frames per second hyperlapse. The length of your hyperlapse is also important. I would opt for a minimum of 10 seconds. However, I like to go for 12 seconds to give myself a cushion either side if I need to make a cut. Therefore, I already know how many photos my hyperlapse will be. 25 frames per second for 12 seconds is 300 photos. Luckily for us, the drone does the maths for us, which makes things just simpler. We also set the interval between the photos. This is the amount of time between each photo that is taken. For fast moving subjects, such as landscapes with clouds, we choose a longer interval to see the movement more effectively. For faster moving subjects, such as people or cars, we want a shorter interval to effectively capture the movement through a scene. For landscapes and clouds, I would shoot around five second intervals, but for the purpose of this video, I'll be shooting moving traffic, so I'll opt for about two to three seconds between shots. We can't go any lower than two seconds as our shutter will be open for one second, and then our drone needs to move to its next location within the spare second before opening the shutter again. So hopefully now we have an understanding of the basic fundamentals of time-lapse and hyperlapse photography. The next step is to find ourselves a location and a subject. Choosing the right location is crucial for stunning night hyperlapses. Look for places with interesting city lights, traffic or unique features that can add depth to your shots. I often start my search on Google Maps. Once I've found a suitable candidate, I usually drive to the location and check them out in person. This is to suss out the lighting, make sure there is good movement and focal points in the scene, as well as checking for potential hazards. It's important to remember, always prioritise safety. Check your local regulations regarding nighttime drone flights and be aware of your surroundings. Now that we have our gear and location set, let's plan our hyperlapse sequence. Think about the duration of your hyperlapse, the framing of your shots and the overall movement you want to capture. Again, for this I often choose the shot I want before I'm in the air. This is crucial because hyperlapses take a long time to shoot and often use an entire battery. For this reason, if you know the shot before you even turn the drone on, you'll save yourself a lot of battery, meaning a safer and more efficient flight. Make sure your drone's firmware is up to date and calibrate your drone as needed. Check for any obstacles in the area and take note of your surroundings. Remember, safety first, fly your drone responsibly, especially at night. Now let's get airborne and capture that stunning hyperlapse. Okay, so one little tip before we get started, and this is super helpful for any drone flights, is connecting your phone to your controller. And what this will do is just give you a little bit of extra safety, and it's going to show your drone exactly where it is on the map. And to do that, you can go to your settings, you go into the Wi-Fi, and if you turn personal hotspot on your phone, you will be able to see your phone in this Wi-Fi list. You can see my phone's already there and connected. And then once you go into the DJI Fly app, what that's going to do is show you your exact position on a loaded map rather than it being a blank map. All point updated. Okay, and there we go. We've got enough satellites. So now that should be okay. Okay. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about some of the specific settings that you need to set. And you can see in the bottom right corner there, there is a camera icon with Pro. Make sure this is selected because this will allow you then to make the changes that you need to set. If it's set in auto, you can't really change that much. So make sure it's set to Pro. 
the second most important thing you have to do is change the format of your, the photos you're taking into RAW. And this is, I would do this regardless because this is going to give you the most flexibility when we come to edit the hyperlapse in post-production. So always make sure that's set to RAW. With white balance is a bit of an open question. Um, th there really isn't a right answer at nighttime photography. It just depends for the look you're going. Because we're shooting in RAW, we can be pretty flexible with that because we can recover most in post. If you aren't going to edit it and you just want to use the MP4, which the drone's going to produce, then I would set this before to the kind of color you're going for. Obviously, if you want a, a warmer, um, more yellow, warm kind of look, then you want to set it to a higher Kelvin. If you want a more blue, kind of cooler look, then set it to a lower Kelvin. Because I'm shooting in RAW, I just set my white balance to 5,500. That's a pretty neutral white balance. And it just means I'll be able to recover as much as possible then in post as I'm shooting in RAW format. I also set the aspect ratio to four by three. This is really important because that way you utilize the whole sensor. And as we're going to be stabilizing it, you don't want to crop that sensor either. 16 by nine will actually crop the sensor. So make sure this is set to four by three. And then what that's going to do is give you more room to stabilize the footage in post-production. Okay, so now it's the time to dive into the camera settings and you want to make sure all of those autos are unticked so you can change them and I'm going to change my shutter speed to one second and then when you see I adjust the ISO it's going to lighten or darken the image. 400 looks about right, I wouldn't go any higher than that. Uh, if I could go low it would be better and then obviously my aperture is set to f2.8 which is as open as it gets and then just take a test photo and this is going to save you a lot of time just to make sure you're getting the look you want and you can see from here i've got the lovely light trails it's exactly what i'm going for in my look so i'm pretty happy with those settings dialed in and i'm happy now to start the hyperlapse to go to the hyperlapse remember just go to that little icon above the shutter button click hyperlapse and we are going to start with Waypoint. So Waypoints is by far my favorite method of shooting in hyperlapses. I think it just gives you the most flexibility and creative options to be able to get a unique look and move within a hyperlapse. And what it does is it allows you to set points at which your drone will fly between and it will do automatically kind of manually adjust between those points. So you can see here, I'm just gonna to fly to my first point, just set the focus, and you can see you can set the pitch, you can set where the drone is, you can set everything. And then if you click Add Waypoint, so that is now where my drone is gonna start or finish. And then as you can see, I'm gonna move around the, the roundabout, and while doing this, I can change my angle, I can change my height, I can change the pitch of the gimbal. Uh, so I wanna kind of reveal what's going on behind the roundabout. So I'm losing altitude. I'm gonna get a bit lower, a bit further back, uh, pitch the camera up, and also try and keep that roundabout quite central as that's my focal point, and add another waypoint. And what the drone's gonna do then is gonna fly and it's automatically going to go between those two points. Now we've set our second waypoint, we can push these three dots and that's gonna bring up the settings for our hyperlapse. And we have sequence, interval, and length. And as mentioned before, the length of the video, we want it to be between 10 and 12 seconds. So I'm going to pick 10 seconds in this instance. And then sequence is a very important saying. This is basically the order in which your drone is going to complete the hyperlapse. You're basically telling your drone which waypoint you want to start it at. In this instance, I'm located between the two waypoints, so it doesn't matter too much. But this can be very handy if you're flying a long way from your start point and in which instance i would set your first waypoint the one which is closest to you then fly to your furthest away waypoint and then you can set the sequence to reverse and that avoids the drone having to fly all the way back to you to start the hyperlapse to fly to the second waypoint and then bring it all the way back so this is just a good battery management tool so just while this hyperlapse does its thing it's worth noting you can see these corner markers around the screen and it's a really handy feature because that's what that's doing is showing you your crop area it's like a bleed mark so when the drone comes to stabilize after it has to crop in on the image and those are your kind of safety lines so 
always make sure you keep your subject within those lines and use them as a safety guide. Anything which comes outside of those lines is likely to be cropped in the stabilization process, either when the drone does it in body or when you come to do it in post-production, which we'll talk about later. Now we can see the end result of the hyperlapse and the first time is without stabilization and the second one is with stabilization I've done in my editing software and you can see waypoints just gives by far the best results. Uh, we'll compare all of them at the end but it's just smooth and that's I think because we have the most control over the drone we're not letting it do anything or choose any of our sayings and for that reason it just yields better results if done properly. Next, we are going to look at the circle method, and this is my second favorite method just because it makes keeps things simple. Uh, the drone does a lot of the work for you. You can see here I just selected a green square over the center of the roundabout. Ideally, you want something brighter than this. I think it did drift a little bit just because it's such a dark area. But basically, you set that area and the drone is just going to circle around it. And then we look at our settings again, we have interval length, speed and rotation. So into interval, I'm going to set it at three seconds. It's not giving me the option for two seconds, but three seconds should be fine. And then video length again, 10 seconds, 12 seconds, if you can, just to give you that extra bit of length. And then speed is how fast a drone is going to move around the circle and 0 0.5 meters per second is pretty good good point to be going from and then the rotation this is which way you want your drone to fly around in that circle and because of my location i'm going to go for clockwise then iso again we're going to go into these settings and 400 looks ideal for me one second shutter speed and aperture at f 2.8 and then i'm just going to confirm that square again and then we once the drone's done its thing, it's going to create the video and we can have a look at our results. Again, first time is unstabilized, second time I've stabilized it in my editing software. And you can see it's a pretty good result. It's kind of the, let the drone do the work for us, which I think it's done an okay job. I would prefer waypoints though. I think waypoints gives you more control and more precise end point. As you can see here, it doesn't quite end where I want it to. It's kind of cropped the bottom of the road out, but not bad. The next method we're going to look at is free. And what free does is it basically gives you the control on the drone to fly and move everything as you wish during the hyperlapse. Now you notice here, I did make a little mistake. I never use this one uh, just because I don't think it's, it always ends up jerky. I've never really had good results with it, but you'll notice that I left the square on from the last one which can be quite handy if you're trying to keep something in the frame while you're moving the drone in this instance i didn't want to so you'll notice that it kind of still locks onto it until i cancel it but basically what this mode is going to allow you to do is start a hyperlapse and you have free control of the drone so i'm pushing the sticks to the right and um, i've got full control of the gimbal but it's moving everything slowly and steadily as i fly so i'm sure it can be useful i've never really ha found a use for it i find waypoints is is far better to get smoother results in the end hyperlapse but i'm sure it does have its place maybe you guys have found a use for it so you'll notice here that i'm able to move the drone move the pitch and i'll speed up the results here now and then you can kind of see that i come around the road and then i lift the gimbal up again maybe i didn't do this mode justice i can kind of see where there would be use for it again i just think waypoints is a more accurate way to do it but you can see the idea. I kind of had full control and the drone has kind of kept everything steady-ish while I've uh, moved between the two points, able to reveal the road at the end. But again, this is probably my least used technique. And then lastly, we have course lock. And what course lock is going to do is basically fly in a straight line. You set the course. Basically, you point the drone in the direction you want to head. You lock the direction and then it's the same settings as before. So I'm going to do a, I'm just doing a six second here just to show you guys, but two second intervals and you also set the speed of the drone in this case, 0 0.5 meters a second is good. And then you hit start the hyperlapse. And what this is going to do is basically fly the drone in a straight line for you and just create a hyperlapse in a straight line with no turning or deviating from that line. And when we look at the results, again, it needs stabilization. As you can see, it's kind of jogging, but once we stabilize it, it's good. I mean, I just prefer something a bit more exciting, a bit more movement, a bit more dynamic. And I feel waypoints again is a far better way to do that. 
So just before we compare the results, if you didn't want to go for the full processing method and you just took your MP4 files off of the drone, this is a quick way just to show you in Final Cut how I would stabilize the video clip. So I can click the video clip just down here. And then in this right hand panel, you have the stabilization method. Click that. It's going to want to do it automatically, but we want to tell it that we want inertia cam. And inertia cam is basically going to stop camera shake. And that's kind of what we're trying to minimalize in these hyperlapse videos. And you can see the difference already. It's absolutely massive. So I'll play it from the beginning without the stabilization and then with the stabilization. So you can see how jerky it is just straight out of the camera. It's kind of shaking all over the place. And then if we hit the stabilization method, look how beautifully that has managed to stabilize it. So if you didn't want to do the full processing method, that's a pretty good way to get good results out of the camera. Just looking back on my results, one of the best is the circle method. This is the least favorite, but I don't think I did it justice. Unfortunately, I think it does have its place, but I just need to refine it better. This I think is my favorite waypoints just because we had the most control over it. It's nice and slow and steady. Everything smooth and keeps everything where I want it to be inside the picture. And the straight line does a good job too, but just kind of lacks any sort of excitement. So I think the trick with these hyperlapses is choose minimal motion, choose smooth motion. And I think you, best that yield those results through waypoints it just gives you the most control to be able to set your in point your out point and that's why it's my preferred method because it just keeps everything nice and smooth and it just makes the whole post-processing so much easier back at the editing desk let's dive into post-processing now we're ready to edit our hyperlapses we can plug our SD card, or in my case, the SSD into the computer, and we come up with these two files here. So we're gonna go into DCIM. Now, if you just wanted the MP4 files, you just wanted to save yourself the hassle of editing, you can go into DJI files and you'll see the processed MP4 file that the drone has created. And that's good to go. But what we wanna do is take this a step further and create the hyperlapse ourselves to give us more control. And we're interested in this folder here called Hyperlapse. And inside you'll see there's a series. And in each one of these, we can open one of those up. And yep, you can see our raw images. And this is just the series of Hyperlapse photos that we want to edit. And I suggest it's a good idea. You save your Hyperlapse files onto your computer or onto a hard drive. And that just means that you have a backup of them ready to go. So I'm going to do that. And then we're going to import them into Lightroom. Okay, now we're ready to import our photos into Lightroom. You'll notice I'm using Lightroom Classic. I just prefer this version. So we're going to hit import and then we're going to find our hyperlapse sequence. And you can see it's here. And then you can see 250 photos. They're all there. They're all selected and we can hit import. I'm going to disable that. So while it's doing this, what we need to do is then to start to edit and we only need to edit one photo and I'll show you the sequence. I can show you the process, sorry, of how we go about doing that. And then we can apply that one edit to all of the photos and export it that way. So I'm gonna double click that and then we're gonna go into develop. And this is where we can start our editing process. Just before we jump into the editing process, I just wanna caveat this, that there's no right or wrong way to do this. Color grading is, a, a lot of personal preference and personal taste so don't feel like you have to copy what I do and don't feel like there's a wrong or right way obviously there are things that look better and things that don't look so good uh, I think the key trick here is do what you think looks good and then dial it back I think that's the common problem is over processing an image and that's kind of what I try and do is find something that I like the look of and then just bring it back a touch because uh, it's, it's small changes that make the big difference overall so that's what we're going to be going for, tiny little tweaks that's going to make a big difference overall. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to drop the highlights and lift the shadows. And that's going to bring out the, the detail in the shadows. And it's also going to bring out some of the recover the detail from the highlights. In turn, it has darkened the image. So we're just going to brighten the image up again, just so we can see what we're working with there. About one stop should do it. I'm going to leave the contrast where it is at the moment. And then I'm just going to tweak these whites and blacks just to 
just to put some darkness into the shadows and just to bring the highlights back up a bit. Okay, so that's kind of a good starting point to work from. Now with the color, you can see that it's quite green here from the trees and the light. So I'm going to adjust the white balance. I'm just going to cool the image down a fair amount here, to be fair. Just looking for those the lights to look a little bit more white. And they're going that way now. That looks good there. Maybe just touch up. And then also add some magenta just to counter that green. And again, just tiny, tiny change here. And you can already see it's kind of giving it that futuristic look where it's taken out the greens and it's more focusing on the blue and the magentas. And that's kind of the look I'm going for here. So I'm just going to tweak that a tiny bit more. I'm just going to... Okay, that looks good. Next, we're going to look at this presence tab here. And what this presence tab is, these are quite dramatic changes. So you need to be careful with these. Just little, little amounts if you are going to use them. So I'm going to avoid using texture here, but you can just to show you what it will do. So I'm going to leave that at zero. Clarity, I'm going to add a tiny, tiny amount, just plus two on there. And dehaze can be quite useful on this because what that's doing, as you can see, is affecting the glow of the lights. And I want to kind of create a bit of separation from those reflections on the road and the and the car lights. So I'm just going to add about plus seven on that. That looks good to me. And then we do want the colors to pop, so I'm going to add some vibrance to that. We're going to go about about there and then I am going to desaturate it just to counter that change I just made there but not by much okay now we're going to move on to tone curves so I'm going to start with the red versus blue and just going to add a control point just click on the line one in the shadows one in the highlights and I'm just going to pull the shadows a touch into the blue and I'm going to counter that with an S curve and putting the highlights into the red. So I might just play around with that position in there. Okay, so again, just small, small changes. And then we're gonna go into the greens and the greens, you know, we can see a lot of that is coming from the shadowy area. So I'm gonna pull that down into the magenta. Not too much, just a touch and counter that again, just a tiny amount into the greens. And then do the same here. I'm just adding S curves to all of them. So, oh. just there. Just creating a bit of separation between the colors in the photo. Okay, so it's getting much closer. There's still things I don't like about this image, which we're gonna fix as we move on. So we're gonna go to this color mixer tab now. I click on this all tab here. And then that gives us control of all of them at one time. So this is allowing you to change the hue, saturation and luminance of each color. And the hue is basically what color that color represents. Saturation is obviously how saturated that one is. And the luminance is how bright that color is. So we can straight away take a look that I'm going to try and make my reds a bit warmer. You can see down here, they're looking a little bit magenta. So if I add a touch of orange to those, that should help with that. And I'm gonna bring the oranges more towards red. So just gonna drop that down a touch, maybe a bit more, bring that back up a little bit. I'm going to leave the yellows, the greens, the aquas, but I am going to make the blues move more towards the aqua just a touch. And you can see what that's doing just down there. And then we can move into saturation. Now, obviously, we want those reds to pop. I love the light trails. So I'm going to increase the saturation of the reds. I'm going to leave the oranges as they are. The yellows, I'm actually going to desaturate just because you can see what it does to the trees down there. You know, if I bring it all the way down, you can see, but I'm going to balance it between the green and the yellow. So I'm going to desaturate the yellow and desaturate the green. And that's already looking much better. It's looking far less green. 
I might bring that down even more to be fair. That looks about right there. And now it's completely taken the green out there. And then I'm gonna leave the aquas and the blues. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring them up a touch. Good stuff. And then I'm going to desaturate the purples. You can see what that's doing. I don't like the look of the purples in this photo in the sky, especially. So I'm going to bring those down. And the same with the magenta as well, just to make those reds pop a bit more. And then we're going to go to luminance here and I want the reds to pop. So I'm going to you can see what that's doing It's kind of making them brighter. So I'm going to move that right up. Oranges, yellows and greens, I'm going to leave where they are, but the aquas, I'm just going to increase them just a touch. Actually, I quite like the look of that, so I'm going to keep moving with that. And I'll do the same for the blues as well. And I'm going to reduce the purples, Take almost take the purples right down and the magenta. Actually, I'm going to leave a bit of magenta in there. Okay, so we're looking much better. Now, because we've pushed the image quite far, we can have a look down here. I'm just looking how, or for any areas where the image might be degraded, and it's actually not looking too bad at all. So normally I'd actually look at reducing some noise in it, but actually we haven't pushed that too far at all. That's the key of not pushing an image too far. We've actually avoided using or needing to use noise reduction. So what I might do is just come back up the top here and I'm just going to tweak a few of these again just to make the image a touch brighter there. Leave the contrast and just reduce those highlights again a bit more. It's always good just to come back to this tab just to play around with what you changed before as with all those color changes you might just need to adjust a few of them. And I think that looks pretty good. So, I mean, we could spend a long time on this. I'm pretty happy with where that is now. Um, so, you know, like I said, it's little changes that make the big change. Obviously, we could keep going with this and I could adjust the colors more, but that's kind of just a basic introduction of how I would adjust the colors in my hyperlapses. So now we can go ahead and export that. First of all, Sorry, we're not going to export it just yet. First of all, we're going to click on this library tab. We need to apply this to all of the images and then click on the grid view down here. And then we've just edited this image here. We want to edit all of these photos, all 250. So what I'm going to do is push Command A on a Mac or Control A, I think, on a PC. And that's going to select all of the photos. And then just down here, there's the Sync Settings button. Make sure you select Check All and that's going to select all of the settings you've changed and then when you push synchronize it's going to paste the settings onto all of the photos so now it's done that let's just have a look in this photo and just waiting for it to load and so you can see there the changes have been posted to that now so that's good to go so we can go back to our grid view and then we're going to have to export all of these images so we go to file export and then we want to choose which folder we want to go in I've already created another hyperlapse so I'm just going to change this to hyperlapse 3 I'm going to call this hyperlapse roundabout and then it's really important that you have the, in this sec sequence custom name you select sequence and what that's going to do is start number is going to be one. So you can see it's hyperlapse around about a one. And this is going to make it easier to create the video. So start number one, and then it's just going to name each photo hyperlapse around about one, two, three, four, etc. So now we've done that, we can hit export. And now we just wait for our photos to export into that file. So once we've done that, I'll meet you guys in Photoshop. Now we're ready to open our hyperlapse in Photoshop and this is where we're going to render all of those images into a video file. So I'm going to select open and then I've found my hyperlapse 
three folder here, which I saved from Lightroom. And you can see I've got each individual image here in this file with a number after telling me that it's in sequence. So one, two, three, four, etc. And to import that as a video into Photoshop, it's really important you push this image sequence here, have that checked. And then when I push open, it's gonna open a video file. Before I do that, it's gonna ask me about frame rate. As mentioned before, I'm in the UK, so I'm gonna go for 25 frames a second, but this is completely dependent on where you are and what you wanna do with the video. Obviously in the US, you might wanna go for 30 frames a second. If you're doing something for a cinema timeline, then it might be 24 frames a second. But in this instance, I'm going 25 frames per second. That's what I usually work to and then hit OK. And then you can see here we have our first image and this timeline here at the bottom. So it's basically just created all of our images into a video. And if I hit the space bar or the play button, you can see that it's going to go through each image and effectively play each image as a video. It's a bit laggy, but that's quite normal. So now we just want to export this as a video file. So to do that, I'm going to go up to file and then export and then render video. And then when I hit that, it's going to come up with all of these options. So we're going to save that as roundabout hyperlapse. Select my folder where I want to save it. And then this here, you can have all your settings here. H.264 is fine, high quality. And I want to set the, the size to the document size. Obviously, it's not great out there. Let's try our document size is set. Frame rate is going to be 25 frames per second. That all looks good, all frames. And then we can go ahead and click render. Now this might take a bit of time. It's gonna basically just create all of those images into one single video file. And once we have that, we're gonna open up Premiere to stabilize this. You can use any video editing software. If you wanna see how I did it in Final Cut Pro, you can look back in the video and you can do the same thing in there. But just to get a bit more flexibility and a bit better results, I do use Premiere and the warp stabilizer in Premiere. So once this is exported, we'll jump into that and we can show you how to stabilize this video, which is the last step of this process. Now for the last piece of the puzzle, we're gonna stabilize the hyperlapse we just exported from Photoshop. So I'm gonna select new project and then I found my roundabout hyperlapse here, which is the one I just exported. I'm gonna hit create. It's gonna ask me, they already exist, that's fine. Replace it. Okay, and then you can see then it's all automatically imported into the timeline. Now you can notice as well that it's in a kind of four by three format, which is what the original photo was. So the first thing I'm gonna do is change that. And to do that, I'm gonna to go to sequence, sequence settings, and then we're just gonna change the frame size to 4K, 3840. by 2160 and that will then just set it to a 4k sized frame now I can select okay okay and then you can see it's automatically cropped in and then you can also see if i just pull up my window so if i select that clip and then you can see here when i play around with the scale you can see that it's all still there. And that just is gonna give us a bit more flexibility when it comes to stabilizing it. So to stabilize it, we're gonna look for the warp stabilizer effects. So I'm gonna go under effects, search warp stabilizer, and it's just there. And then I'm just gonna drag that and drop it onto the clip. And then it's gonna to start to do its thing here. You can see here as well, it's analyzing the video. It's going through each frame, tells you how long it's remaining, and then it's basically just gonna do the hard work for you and stabilize it. So we'll just wait until that's completed. And there we have it. You can see there, it just kind of cropped it and moved it a bit. That shows me that it's done. It's also said it's completed here. And then the final thing you wanna do is obviously just crop out the black bars we've got. So I can do this by sliding the scale here and I just want to crop it in to make sure that we've got no no edges left so I'm gonna go out a bit there just 
chest there looks good. And I'm also just going to move the frame up to center the roundabout, bring more of that road in. And there we have it. And then finally we can export that. So I'm gonna to go to export, rename it to what you want to name it. Okay, and then I want it 4K, so I'm gonna select the 4K option and then everything else should be good and I can hit export. And then it's just gonna do its thing and I'll show you the final product once it is into, once it's completed that. Once it's exported, you guys can see the final result. I'm pretty happy with that. All that hard work has paid off. I know it was a long video today, but I really hope you guys found that worthwhile. And there you have it. A comprehensive guide to creating stunning night hyperlapses with your DJI drone. Let me know in the comments if you have any specific questions or if there's anything else you'd like me to cover in a future video. I'd love to hear from you. If you found this tutorial helpful, make sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and give this video a thumbs up. It really helps the channel grow, and I appreciate your support. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until next time, happy flying.